We waiting so long. Who killed my son? His head. His head. His head. Uh, sibling family. Um, he kind of. He kept, we kept the family together through sports. I haven't heard anything in terms of Brian Pace. Either somebody close to him, a friend, a family member, somebody has to know. Brian Patta, Creative Writing, January 25th, 2004. Challenges, obstacles, and hope. Life has always been a challenge, an obstacle of test of who I am and what I'll become. My name is Brian Patta, and this is my story. A story of love, perseverance, remorse, and hope. To begin with, my family is from Haiti and moved to the States with my older brother. Fortunately, I was born in the States, so it was easier for my parents to get me enrolled in Dade County school system faster. Not knowing the American language, it was hard for my parents to find immediate work and trying to communicate to others, well, that was difficult at times. Being in a country of freedom and opportunity, that was the greatest reward for the price of sacrifice my family and I made. This is a college essay written by a 20-year-old Brian Patton. Only two years after penning his essay, Dude was on the verge of really cashing in on that opportunity he spoke about, as he was projected to be taken in the 2007 NFL Draft. But the suit he picked out to wear on draft day instead ended up being the suit that he was buried in. Brian Patton was a defensive lineman at the University of Miami. The NFL was his dream. But ironically, the closer Brian got to that dream, the more he was haunted, by his nightmares. At one point, the nightmares got so bad that a 6'4", 280-pound NFL-bound D-tackle would hop out of bed in the middle of the night, grab his guns, and then go sleep in the closet. Here's a quote from his brother. I remember him saying, man, they keep chasing me. These people, somebody, they keep chasing me in my damn dream. And sadly, the man who chased Brian Patton in his dreams eventually caught up to him in real life. Finding his killer took 15 long years, but sometimes all you need to do is open your eyes. This is what happened to Miami football player Brian Patton, a player who was believed to be murdered 15 years ago by his own damn teammate. Cue the way. Yeah, I'm not no all right, before we jump into the video, a quick word from today's video sponsor, Sleeper. So football season is back, which also means fantasy football season is back. And if you're looking for a new platform for your fantasy football needs, today's video sponsor might be exactly what you need. Sleeper is the fastest growing fantasy platform out there already with millions of users on deck. It actually offers a more modern fantasy football experience. When compared to other apps, Sleeper users actually talk to their league mates more as this was part of the core philosophy they had in mind when they created the app. You've got your integrated chat, a dope interface, and they've even implemented a new matchmaking system. So if you don't just have them friends on deck, you can easily find a group and make some. Now the app's also got a cool story behind it and y'all know your boy is into the story. So you had two childhood friends with a common bond over sports cars. But when their families moved to opposite coast, they were basically just sending cars through snail mail. It was kind of taking forever and they couldn't interact the same way that they'd done before. They eventually discovered fantasy apps and that kind of became like the glue in their friendship. But those apps were missing some of the features that could have heightened the experience. So when these two friends grew up, they created the fantasy app that they always wanted when they were kids, which perfectly explains the focus on interaction and the chat. The app's 100% free, no ads. They got redraft, dynasty, best ball, however you play. So if you're interested, click the link in the description to download the app and get started on drafting your fantasy team today. Shout out to Sleeper once again for sponsoring the video. But other than that, let's get it. As a kid, Brian Patta's mom moved him and his eight siblings to different areas around Miami as she was looking for an affordable and safe place to raise them. As they were a large family living on a tight budget, Brian and his five brothers would pile in one room and his three sisters would sleep in another. Like Brian mentioned in the essay I read at the beginning, his mom was a Haitian immigrant and the language barrier made things hard for the Patta family in more ways than one. Due to that language barrier, Brian and his siblings leaned on each other for companionship, keeping the outside 
world in arm's length. The youngest of the six boys were Edwin and Brian himself. They were only one year apart with Brian being a baby. When they were young, the two boys vowed that they would use football to get their family into a better situation. While Edwin was pretty good and ended up walking on at Florida State to play tight end, it was the youngest and ironically the biggest of all the Paddock kids who actually had a legit opportunity to be something special on the football field. After being ranked the nation's 26th best defensive lineman as a high school senior, Brian Sidney Pata accepted a scholarship offer to the University of Miami in 2003. He selected the U in part because he wanted to stay close to home, which makes perfect sense when you consider how close-knit his family was. But Brian was no longer the little kid sleeping six to a room. Like literally any human, the conditions he grew up in had molded his personality, his thought process, belief systems, and general outlook on life. He and his brother had grown up admiring the fully decked out old school Chevys they'd see cruising through the streets of Miami. So once they got their hands on a little bit of money, Brian and one of his older brothers started buying cars, customizing them, fixing them up, and then reselling them. Brian loved cars and he even wanted to open up a shop after he was done with football. The fact that he had an entrepreneurial spirit and was going about it legally is really dope to see. But unfortunately, we never got a chance to see how far he could take that business by putting some real NFL money behind it. But still, while they had occasional issues as any small business would, this was one of the few bright spots in a life filled with conflict. Thanks to a side business and a guy who Brian referred to as my guy, Brian was able to keep a few dollars in his pocket. He drove a black infinity with custom spinners and he was said to be a pretty demonstrative and aggressive guy who never backed down from a challenge. He was also said to be a pretty cool cat. If you was cool with him, he was cool with you. Here's a quote on Brian's personality from his college teammate, Greg Olson. He was a happy and fun guy. He was that guy in the locker room that kept everybody entertained. He always had the one-liners that made everybody laugh. He was a good spirit and a good guy to have around. While he had lots of friends and got lots of love on the team, he also had his share of enemies. The University of Miami was a wild place between the 80s and the mid 2000s specifically. The same year Brian Patter lost his life to a gunshot wound, there was another shooting that exact same year involving two of his teammates. In 2006, linebacker Willie Cooper was shot in his own yard one morning. His teammate Brandon Merriweather, who was with him, shot back. Bro, they had a whole shootout, but by the end of the year, that wasn't even a top 10 news story at the school. In the intro, I mentioned how Brian was stricken with nightmares toward the end of his life. This wasn't random paranoia. This was earned paranoia. Dude had been threatened multiple times from multiple different sources, all in that same year. He was surrounded by ill will, with much of it reaching dangerous levels in 2006. In two seasons at Miami, Brian recorded 23 tackles and five sacks. And once the coaches changed Brian's position from defensive end to defensive tackle, his draft stock began to rise. He was expected to be taken between the second and third round during the 2007 NFL Draft. 2007 was the year everything was gonna change. But making it through 2006, that was an uphill battle. Towards the end of 2005, Brian met Jada Brody, and the two quickly fell for each other and had the typical hot and cold college relationship. You know, young couples struggling to process those really strong emotions, and it leads to a relationship that just confuses all the people around you. You love hard, fight hard, break up, make up, rinse, repeat, over and over. And seven months after they met, the couple moved in together in May of 2006. So two of the suspects in this case were actually connected to Jada in some way, as one of the suspects was her brother and another suspect was her ex. Now to be fair to Jada, Brian had his ex-girlfriends lurking around as well, with one of them showing up to the apartment one day, wielding a knife and making threats. So they both had a bit of baggage from previous relationships. So at one point, Brian and Jada got into a huge argument when Jada told Brian something from her past. That's the quote that we got. Probably about her ex-boyfriend who we're about to talk about in a second. So anyway, the couple really did care about each other, but they would get into these big fights, you know? So every now and then they would get into fights so big that Jada's family would actually get involved. They'd pick up the phone, call Brian, and he'd have heated discussions sometimes with her dad and then one time with her brother. And according to Brian's sister, during early to mid-2006, Brian and Jada's brother had their biggest argument yet. Now, Brian's sister wasn't privy to the full conversation, but she later told police that her brother was very upset after the call, and he interpreted whatever was said on the call 
as a threat on his life a threat that he took extremely seriously because he went back to his house got his guns came back to her house and stayed over there that night he really thought something was gonna go down this story obviously made jada's brother a suspect at some point point. and if you feel like brian was overreacting to the alleged threat check this out so jada's dad uncle and brother had all spent time in prison a brother who was only 19 at the time already had a pretty long rap sheet including violent incidents involving guns and he also had some drug charges thrown in there as well now obviously i ain't gonna just judge somebody because they got a little bit of a rap sheet but when that person threatens my life i just take it a little bit more seriously because i know that they've done crimes before you know what i'm saying so they're more likely to, to do them again. But Jada's twin brother wasn't the only one making threats on Brian's life. During that same year, 2006, Brian was at a nightclub with his brother and a few teammates when a fight broke out in the club. Brian's teammate later told the police that the aggressor was a gang member that Brian knew previously. He says the fight got crazy, stuff was flying, some dude got hit with a pipe, but when it was all over, a tall skinny cat with a big chain on looked in Brian's direction and said, we gonna get you. That's threat number two. And that same teammate told the police that he later received calls warning him that somebody had placed a hit out on him and Brian. So he tells Brian about the call he got and here's a firsthand account of what happened next. Brian said, I'll handle it. Yeah, it's all good. My people know they people. Then the next day, Brian told his boy, I took care of him. We good. Later that same year, Brian was involved in another fight at another club. This time he was involved in a whole car chase leaving the scene. Once he eventually evaded dude that was chasing him, this man pulled up to a Denny's, went inside, sat down, and ate. Some of y'all gonna hear that and think, this is a man who did not fear death. But when you talk about the nightmares, when you talk about him sleeping in the closet with his guns and then going over his sister house, this is a cat who was very paranoid and honestly, he probably went to Denny's because he felt a public space was safer than going home at that point. And if I'm right about that, once your life gets to that point, something has gone horribly wrong. So his girl's family had threatened his life, gang members at the club had threatened his life, but at least he was safe within his college football team, right? Not exactly. From the very beginning, the leading suspect in Brian's murder was Rashawn Jones, a defensive back who was once considered to be one of the top DBs in the country, but he unfortunately wasn't able to live up to that hype during his career in Miami and at the time of this story had mostly been relegated to special teams. Rashawn had previously dated Brian's girlfriend Jada and this was the initial source of contention between him and Brian. Now according to reports, Rashawn was the type of guy who would just constantly throw in Brian's face that he was the one who had Jada first. Like seriously, the articles say he brought it up constantly. And because of that whole deal, Rashawn and Brian was always at it. They basically just had an ongoing beef. So during the summer of that disastrous 2006 year, Rashawn actually got into an argument with a different teammate, a cat named Eric Monker. Apparently Brian was nearby and he heard the commotion when, you know, the argument broke out between Rashawn and this other guy. So when Brian walks over and sees this Rashawn, Sean, things immediately go left. Check this out. Brian just, like, he, he started getting in Rashawn's face. And then, uh, you know, their argument escalated. And then they started fighting. So, Brian get on top of this dude and headbutts him five times. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom. So they even ain't do nothing. So I just, ah, I dove in there, I grabbed Brian, I threw Brian out, threw Rashawn out the room. And then Rashawn was like, boy, you might as well go ahead and clip up, boy. So after he said that, I was like, y'all stupid. Y'all ain't finna, y'all, are y'all really finna like shoot each other right now? I actually read that they fought multiple times, but 
That's the only time where it's like detailed out what happens exactly during the fight. By November 7, 2006, Brian Pettit had three recent threats on his life, all coming from people who seemed pretty capable of carrying it out. On top of all of that was an unhappy customer who had bought a custom ride from Brian and his brother, only to find out four days later that the transmission was bad. Little bit of bad blood there. Then there was another guy who accused Brian of stealing his rims. When he confronted Brian about the rims, Brian basically just cursed the dude out and sent him on his way. But apparently he found out where Brian lived, and Jada had even seen dude creeping near Brian's car basically trying to further inspect the rims so we got jada's brother jada's ex slash brian's teammate the alleged gang members at the club he got the fighting with unhappy customer with the bad transmission and now we got to add in the real man and if it's starting to kind of feel like brian was boxed in from all sides it's because he was he was surrounded by enemies and he really needed to get the hell out of there, bro. These should have been some of the best days of Brian's life, as he was said to be selected in the NFL draft in only a few months. But he feared that he'd been living so fast and making enemies at such a rapid pace that he may actually never reach the finish line. He wasn't sleeping well in those final days, as he struggled to find peace with so much vitriol surrounding him. On November 6, 2006, only one day before Brian would be shot, he took his girl Jada out to the bowling alley, and witnesses who saw him that night say it was the happiest they'd ever seen him. But Brian was also texting his older brother that night, asking him to pray for him because he had a bad feeling. I remember him saying, man, they keep chasing me. These people, somebody keep chasing me in my dreams. He asked his brother to pray for him and this is how his brother responded. Okay, I'll do that. But bro, nothing is gonna happen to you. But after a fun night at the bowling alley, the very next day, all of the wrong dreams would come true for Brian. Not his dreams of reaching the NFL, but instead, it was the nightmares. It was the nightmares that came true. The morning of November 7, 2006 started like any other day. Brian went in for his early morning meeting and workout session, registered for some classes, and grabbed lunch with Jada. At lunch, his teammate Eric joined the couple and talked about Brian's future in the NFL, how his stock was rising, and how some people were now saying that he could go as early as the second round. Later on that same day, Brian and his D-lineman buddies actually throw ice water on their position coach, playfully, of course, all in celebration of the coach's birthday. And from the sounds of things, for Brian at least, it had been a pretty good day. But the day wasn't so great for Rashawn Jones, who had been suspended from the team that very same day after failing his third drug test. Brian lingered in the locker room for a while, taking his sweet time and even singing in the shower. But as he was finally leaving the building, tight end Chris Zellner overheard a heated argument between Brian and somebody on the other end of his phone. I've never seen him get that annoyed or pissed off unless it was on the football field. I wasn't really trying to eavesdrop. I just remember him talking about like, if you won't come see me then. So we got hella threats already hanging over Brian's head and now there was a direct invitation for smoke for whoever that was on the other end of the phone. So Brian finally leaves the facility, but he still doesn't go straight home. He actually sees a couple of his teammates standing on a bus stop. You know, underclassmen don't have a car. And Brian does the stand up thing that a teammate should do. He piled as many of them as he could fit in his car and gave him a ride back to the dorm. All right, boys, y'all take it easy. I'll see you tomorrow. He pulls off. He only had to drive four miles to get back to his apartment, but decided to give his brother a call to help pass the time. They talked about paint colors for a Chevy that they was fixing up, just kind of basically going through ideas when suddenly the call drops. Brian's brother thought it was a little bit weird knowing that his little bro would never hang up on him, but I guess he figured he'd just call him back whenever he got a better signal or whatever, you know? But unfortunately, that would never happen. When Brian finally pulled up to his apartment around seven o'clock that night, he parked his truck, hopped out, and a few seconds later, he was dead. Police said the shooter had been there waiting in the bushes or possibly behind the dumpster. According to a medical examiner, Brian was shot once in the head, just above his ear, with a medium caliber bullet. Brian's girlfriend Jada was upstairs in the apartment at the time. When she heard the gunshot, she ran down to see what was going on. But when she got there, she saw Brian laying motionless on the ground. People ran over to help. They were trying CPR. It was calling the police, but nobody saw the shooter. Some theorized that the shooter was a pro based one on the shot placement and then two on the fact that he left no evidence behind. Also, Brian had nearly a thousand dollars in his pocket completely untouched. The shooter didn't take any of Brian's money or personal belongings. 
but he did take away the most valuable thing Brian possessed. Later that night in the aftermath of the shooting, the team called an emergency mandatory meeting. Players experienced the entire range of emotions, you know, grief, anger, shock, but every single player on the roster showed up to the meeting, except one, Rashawn Jones, man. He was a no-show. Now again, Rashawn had been suspended that day, but every player is still expected to show up to a team meeting, especially an emergency mandatory meeting. Now certain players who knew of their ongoing beef immediately suspected Rashawn of foul play and his absence from that meeting only heightened that suspicion from his teammates. It was super easy to suspect Rashawn. He clearly had a motive, had already threatened Brian, and during the immediate aftermath of Brian's death, nobody could find him. But believe it or not, it actually goes even deeper than that. When interviewed, several teammates said Rashawn had hit them that day on the phone trying to borrow money, presumably to go out of town. But I actually think that money might have been for something different. Stick around, we'll get there in a second. So following Brian's death, nobody could reach Rashawn. They called the girl that he was dating at the time. She couldn't reach him either. So hours and hours go by, but at some point, Rashawn does show up at his girlfriend at the time's house. And she later tells one of the coaches that when he did show up, he was just completely out of it. Now, Miami's law enforcement liaison at the time was Ed Hudak. He was in charge of the early part of the investigation. Here's a quote. There was a very strong sentiment that Jones had something to do with it. When that was brought up to me by the players, I made sure that the detectives had that. What came of those leads? I don't know. Now, Rashawn's alibi was as follows. He basically said he was down after being suspended by the team, so he decided to turn his phone off to kind of clear his head and drown out the noise. Then when he turned it back on, Brian had been killed and everything was going crazy. I mean, that's actually plausible. And apparently the police thought so too since Rashawn was never arrested, at least not at that time. The police had tons of information to go off of to find Brian's killer. They may have actually had too many leads. In this particular investigation, there were so many leads that we, it was nonstop for a very long time. Try to understand like, Brian's world, you know, who are the people that he associates with, uh, what are the typical places that he hangs out, has he had any issues with anybody, interviewing teammates and friends. There is somebody out there with direct knowledge of who's responsible for killing Brian Pat. And, and hopefully now they're a lot older and, you know, they do a little bit of soul searching and just make that phone call. That's all it takes. Let's run back down the main ones. First, you got his contentious relationship with Jada's family. And Brian had sold the possibly stolen rims, but the rim man could have still been lurking out there. Add in the hit that had once been allegedly placed on him. Also the alleged gang members he'd fought at various clubs. Then there's his contentious history with Rashawn Jones. Like bro, there's even a drawing from a psychic reading on this case. So much information, so many leads, but still nothing. The police got stuck. They investigated the lady who bought the car with the busted transmission. That didn't go nowhere. But it's actually a pretty crazy story, man. A lady met a guy while playing World of Warcraft, bought him a car because she felt he was his guardian angel. The car that she bought was the one from Brian and his brother. Look, let's, let's just move on, man. Like, this stuff is wild. Next, they found a cat in a Miami jail who said he recalled the cellmate who claimed that he was paid to kill a guy over a girl. Okay, now this might actually be something. So the dude said he was offered the contract earlier in the year, but declined it. But when the holidays rolled around, he says he needed the money, so he decided to take it. So the hit was for a total of $10,000. He got $3,000 up front. He says the cat who ordered the hit gave him the gun and rehearsed the entire thing with him. He also said he never got the rest of the money. And he said he wasn't worried because he left the crime scene perfectly clean, didn't leave nothing behind, and he knew he wasn't gonna get caught. Now, bro, this is a legend, but if Rashawn hired this dude, the whole thing actually would make sense. The rehearsal they did for the shooting could have been him telling dude where to hide, you know, the bushes or the dumpster, telling him where Brian's parking spot was and 
what time he got out of practice. And that money that Rashawn was said to be trying to borrow from his teammates on that day, that could have been him trying to scrape together either the rest of the $10,000 or a portion of it to pay to do something just to get him off his back for, you know, and buy some time. Also, there's no records that indicate that the alleged shooter was locked up during the time Brian was shot. This particular guy in question actually didn't get locked up until the following month on a non-related robbery charge. Now, dude in jail could have made this entire thing up because it was a high profile case and he was trying to get some time taken off his sentence. That's totally possible. But the police did follow up on that lead. The guy denied killing Brian and, you know, they had no evidence, so they couldn't prove it. 15 years later, and the Pata family had still received no justice, no closure, no peace. Edwin Pata had dreams about his little brother Brian for 15 years. Here's an excerpt of him describing it from an Outside the Lines article written by Elizabeth Merrill. At night, Brian speaks. He's dreadlocked and 280 pounds strong, and he touches his brother Edwin's head. There is no pain anymore, Brian tells him, but over and over, Edwin asks him the same question. Who did it? The answer is always unintelligible. Edwin sees the number 27 and Brian tells him to look out the window. Then Edwin wakes up, tries to scribble notes and wonders what it all means. I believe he's trying to tell me something. I know he is. The number 27 thing is interesting. Rashawn Jones wore number 38, one digit higher in each spot. Look, it's probably just a dream, probably doesn't mean anything, but I don't rule nothing out. But if y'all got any theories of what the number 27 could mean, put them in the comments section because, you know, I'm curious. Brian's mom, Miss Jeanette Patta, has also struggled for years in the aftermath of her son's death. She can even perfectly choreograph every move dude made the last day she saw him. She knows what he ate, what he said, when he laughed, when he left, everything, you know what I'm saying? She just go over it over and over again in her head, you know? That's the last memory she has of her son. Over the years, she's developed heart issues, had a stroke, and has been recently hospitalized. At one point, her kids even feared that she wouldn't live to see Brian's killer brought to justice. Then, on August 20th, 2021, after 15 years of being left in the dark, police arrested former teammate Rashawn Jones and charged him with first degree murder in the death of Brian Pata. Rashawn still maintains his innocence and Brian Pata's family still feels they lack closure. Today, Rashawn Jones is a 35 year old dad who found the woman of his actual dreams, had a kid, got married and all. But since he's believed to be the person to have stolen that opportunity from Brian Pata by taking his life, Rashawn is now having everything stripped away from him. Now, Rashawn still gotta be tried in a court of law and found guilty. But in addition to everything we've already gone over in the video, cell phone towers actually shown that Rashawn made a call from nearby the crime scene around the time the crime took place. Now, keep in mind, Rashawn's alibi was that his phone was off and nobody could reach him all of a sudden after the incident. According to reports, right before the incident, he was in that area and he made a call. Another potential storyline that I didn't really see mentioned anywhere, potential jealousy. Again, Rashawn Jones was a highly ranked recruit coming out of high school, but when he got to Miami, things didn't go his way on the field. But at the time, Brian had Jada, he won the fight that they were in, and he was projected to continue his career while things weren't looking so bright for Rashawn. If he did it, if he had something to do with it, that could have played a role. So this whole story was a wild ride. One of those situations where nobody wins. And for me at least, the lesson that kind of comes from this whole thing, it's an old cliche. I'm sure all of y'all heard of this. Never make a permanent decision based on temporary feelings. If Rashawn Jones did what he's being accused of, murdered a former teammate who he had beef with because of a girl, at the time, he probably felt he was drowning in those feelings. The anger from everything he felt he lost to Brian. But 15 years later, and if it wasn't for this murder, none of that stuff would even matter to Rashawn. He's moved on, has a wife, a kid, and a life. But now he's gonna be dragged away from all of that based on a decision he made 15 years ago. When I talk to young men kinda in their early 20s, I always tell them like, bro, your problems right now in five years won't matter at all. Like all this stuff you stressing about today, you won't even care. Oh girl, you won't even care. In two years, in one year, it won't matter. You will have moved on. Don't do something stupid today and then ruin the rest of your life. It won't matter. As for Brian, first off, 
Rest in peace, man. The lesson I took from Brian's situation is this. You ain't gotta be friends with everybody, but you wanna be careful of making too many enemies. Look, man, we all got them. I done made plenty of them just on the internet these past several years. So it is gonna happen, but you do wanna watch your positioning, right? Like just to kind of go back to like a football analogy. You don't wanna be caught out of position surrounded by the other team. Here's the thing about that in Brian's case. He was looking to reposition. It was just gonna take a little bit of time. 2007 NFL draft he just had a couple months left and the thing that kind of saddens me the most is the fact that he never had the chance to mature and potentially right some of his wrongs I just can't help but to empathize with him because he seemed like ultimately a good guy with many of the same values as most of us he was the type of guy to give his underclassmen teammates a ride. He would fight to protect his friends. He loved his family. But the person he had to become just to survive, just to get to the point he was at, that person had unfortunately made some enemies along the way. I really wish he could have gotten drafted and had the opportunity to get out of Miami because then he would have had the opportunity to grow into the person he was meant to be. But unfortunately, due to the events that took place November 7, 2006, never got that chance. Peace.